presenter is um, Marily uh, Prophet. She's a senior program officer in OCLC Research, and she'll tell us a little bit about how libraries can support massive online online courses and retain their services with the prospect of an inside-out library. So. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm back. I'm talking about MOOCs this time. Uh, and um, the obligatory, uh, I'm a first-time attendee at ELAG, and I've really enjoyed um, my time here and was pleased to be uh, included in such a wonderful and distinguished program. And I'm going to uh, start with what seems to be the obligatory map um, showing where I am and where you are. Uh, I'm uh, based in Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, and there is indeed quite a gap um, represented here geographically uh, between um, where I usually am and where I am today. And I'd like to acknowledge that a lot of what I'm going to be reporting on is um, uh, the MOOC situation in the United States, because um, US institutions have been early adopters of MOOCs in their current incarnation. But I will um, talk a little bit about how that translates to a more global environment. I'd also like to um, talk a little bit bit about my work and situate myself in that way. I work for OCLC Research, which provides both internal consultation to OCLC products and services, but also does uh, work for the library community to move the library community forward, we'd like to think, um, in terms of understanding the changing library environment. And the assignment that I received on MOOCs and libraries was one of those um, kind of document the landscape and then get the word out to the community. And the organization, um, within the organization, I work primarily with the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which is a group of over 160 institutions. Um, we are a transnational group, primarily situated in North America, but with a uh, fairly broad and increasing representation in Europe, um, Australia, and New Zealand, and, and a tiny bit in Asia as well. So also acknowledging that this is kind of the context that I work in is a larger research library context. Um, which includes academic libraries, national libraries, uh, archives, a smattering of museum libraries. So how many of you know what the term MOOC is or have heard the term MOOC? So I'm seeing perhaps half the audience raise their hand. Um, so it is an acronym that stands for Massive Open Online Course. And it's kind of an unfortunate, ugly word, MOOC. Um, but I think we're kind of stuck with it for now. Um, so massive, it scales to large numbers. These are big classes. Um, some of these courses get up into the, um, into the tens and hundreds of thousands of, of people simultaneously taking a course at one time. Open, free and accessible to all. Also a, a notion that it's collaborative, that there's um, communication and dialogue going on between the people who are taking in the class. It's not a one-way experience uh, like, a, like a YouTube channel might be. Um, online, it's uh, really designed to be of the network, of the web, and um, even though it's a it's a core it's a course, it's, so it's not just a textbook. Um, it's it's really a, a put together course. Um, although they t they tend to be short, they are uh, classes. Um, so, you know, there's kind of this media frenzy. Um, you know, the wonderfulness of uh, of of these environments that where you'll receive individual or per personal attention. You can take it on your schedule um, from any place on the planet uh, that, that somehow MOOCs will account for individual differences in learning and that they really are, are much better um, than what we see the, these large, crowded, and anonymous classes in um, ordinary American universities. Um, this is uh, not the first time we've heard this type of frenzy. This, um, this is uh, how... Um, the University of Chicago's home study department, um, the media reacted to uh, online correspondence courses in the 1920s. And of course, since then, we've seen distance education um, through many uh, evolutions, radio, television, and indeed online distance education. Um, uh, but, and, and we've also seen before kind of cries of um, crisis in, in higher education. And I'd like to uh, refer you to this 
excellent article by Nicholas Carr that appeared in the MIT Technology Review in September 2012, in which he calls out online instruction as being um, a, a, a force that will perhaps um, uh, bring uh, college administrators, particularly at elite institutions, to reconsider assumptions about the form and meaning of teaching. For better or worse, the net's disruptive forces have a rise at the gates of academia. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that this is, you know, MOOCs are not anything new in terms of online education. There are certainly, uh, and have been for a while, uh, a, ver a number of variety and forms of online education. Of course, we have um, online uh, course packages that are that we use on our classes uh, for a variety of purposes. Um, there are things like iTunes University, TED, and the Khan Academy, which have been with us for a while. Um, the first uh, MOOC was launched in 2008 um, by Stephen Downs and George Simmons, um, and it was this course called Connectivism and C Connective Knowledge, and it was a course that they taught to 25 students in person and um, a couple thousand students online. And that really um, conceptualized this, this whole idea that, that you could uh, have a, a platform that would support this, this online learning environment. Um, in April, April 2012, it's, it's really hard to believe uh, for those of us who've been following this for a while that it, it has been just a little over a year. Um, these three uh, uh, startup.com companies um, launched, all of them based um, in the um, Silic uh, n not all of them based in Silicon Valley. Uh, Udacity and uh, Coursera are based in the Silicon Valley. edX is, um, uh, was launched by as a co-venture between um, Harvard and MIT. Um, but these, uh, these institutions, I'm going to put these up on slide share so you don't need to strain yourself to um, look at this diagram. But this just shows um, the variety of uh, funding that these um, institutions are receiving in the, um, in the millions of dollars from um, venture capital companies and also from uh, large investment from, um, from academic institutions as well, particularly in the case of edX. Um, it's, it's also interesting to compare them to um, uh, a, an organization that's been around the block for a while, like the Khan Academy, which is um, nonprofit. And so look at these business models. If you have a chance to look on SlideShare, I think that these are really quite interesting. Um, and there are more of these. Um, and they seem to be kind of crawling out of the woodwork all the time with a variety of funding from um, grant, f grant uh, foundations that are interested in um, promoting broader education online, as well as um, uh, venture capital. Um, uh, and some of these names will be familiar to you, to you such as Code Academy. Um, Peer to Peer U is uh, one that was um, sort of new to me, but it, they have uh, a badging system for classes. Um, also interesting to look at, but not necessarily in partnership with, um, with elite universities as um, Coursera and, uh, and edX are. Um, and of course, don't rule out Google. Google has um, a course builder, and they have run um, a number of MOOCs themselves uh, on uh, searching on the Google platform. So I would not count them out in this space. Um, so why, why now? Well, there are these, uh, so my, my uh, colleague Jim Mahalko has put these two um, publications together and uh, asks the question, is the academy really ripe for the type of disruption that's characterized by Clayton Christensen, who's a um, kind of a, a business wonky guy. Um, this uh, report from Ithaca called The Cost Disease in Higher Education, Is Technology the Answer? was published in October 2012 and, um, and kind of hits a couple of high points that um, that kind of match up with Christensen's disruption model. So um, the academy, Bowen claims, is guilty of uncontrolled costs, um, leading to rising student debt. Um, students are uh, have larger and larger debt loads and, and no necess not necessarily prospects for jobs that go along with it because they're not learning uh, critical skills, according to Bowen. Bowen also accuses the, the academy of being resistant to innovation, 
um, and ties this to uh, the tenure system and um, lack of accountability within the institution. Um, and also uh, calls out that in many cases tuition is uh, subsidizing research on campus so that so a lot of these rising costs are passed along to, to students um, and, and uh, on the back end the institution is, is doing research and, and not really passing along uh, the goodness of the tuition increases to, um, to, to the students. Um, so in, in Christensen's um, uh, thesis is that, is that uh, innovators will come in and they have lower performance by what are at the time kind of the mainstream values, but they're good enough for new or edge customers. Um, they're cheaper, simpler, and convenient. Um, and with experience and investment, um, uh, disruptors can come in and uh, push it and create a tipping point um, and take over the old market. And you can see this, you know, this has happened definitely in publishing, in, uh, in newspaper journalism, um, et cetera. So each time an elite um, structure, you know, is, is, uh, is, is challenged, there's a, there's, a, there's a disruptor to swoop in. And of course we've seen, um, we've seen I think uh, um, that, that there have been many times in the history of higher education, in the US at least, where there have been these kind of challenges to um, elite structures. When uh, women and minorities were admitted into the academy, there was a big, you know, swell, this is gonna, um, you know, this is gonna ruin everything, everything's gonna change. Um, when community colleges and technical colleges and even land grant institutions uh, came along, um, those were seen as as big disruptors. This was really going to change everything. And even the GI Bill, the um, uh, the, the bill that um, sent many of our uh, veterans to colleges. So you know, is this really different? Um, and we are seeing this kind of uh, media frenzy that that accompanied the um, Chicago Home Study Program. Um, it's not just wonkish white papers and business speak, but this is also being covered in the popular press. The New York Times declared uh, um, 2012 the year of the MOOC. Um, but it really goes on beyond that. So some interesting developments um, in California, the state in which I live, um, the California State Senate uh, um, initiated a bill to require state schools, which is, you know, the vast majority of our higher education system in California are state-based schools, to offer online versions of classes that are too full. And um, kind of core classes that, that are too full that fill up is, is a real problem for, um, for, for students uh, with budget cuts. Um, there aren't as many seats in these classes, so the students aren't able to get the basics and they aren't able to go on and complete their degree in a, in a timely fashion. So um, when the government starts to get involved in mandating educational um, stuff, you know that you're in trouble. Um, and ripped from the headlines just yesterday, Coursera announced that they're gonna be um, partnering with 10 large, and by large I mean really large, public university systems. Um, and this will open online classes to a potential 1.25 million students at public institutions in the United States. And this includes institutions such as the State University of New York system, um, Tennessee, University of Colorado, University of Houston, Kentucky, Nebraska, New Mexico, et cetera. And you see there the very happy looking um, chancellor of the State University of, of New York who's just signed her deal with Coursera. Um, and this will uh, either allow students to take classes fully online for credit, or there will be a blend of um, watching courses online that are provided by Coursera uh, with, um, with some um, individualized personal attention. So there'll be perhaps a mix of this. It's gonna be really interesting to see how this plays out in the US um, educational situation. And for me, this, um, this is an assignment that not only has um, professional interest for me, but also very personal. So these two young ladies in this picture are my 18-year-old stepdaughter, who's a freshman at um, NYU this year, and my, uh, and my six-year-old daughter, who's in kindergarten right now. And um, we and Anne have both taken on pretty big debt to um, launch her on, her on her college career with you know, no real promise that it's gonna result in her having a great job at the end of it. And with my, my six-year-old, the way that tuition costs are rising in the United States, I really can't even fathom 
being able to afford sending her to college so looking at the two of these girls i think that their educational prospects are likely to be quite different and also looking at and and her college experience you know she she can register for classes online and she can submit her her papers at the very last minute using email instead of sliding them under the door like i used to do um but her college experience her residential college experience is really very similar to mine and um it really is kind of remarkable in this age of technology technological technological change that higher education hasn't changed all that much in close to 30 years um and you know as a marker of that technological change some of my very best family photos are on instagram you know it's uh it's that's where it is so so where are um where where is the library in MOOCs? Um, so I, I set out to find out. And first we started poking around in different um, environments in the edX platform. Um, you can select a an institution. This shows a, um, edX is bigger now. Um, and then select a class and then kind of look around in about the class and try to find the library in there. Um, there's a textbook that's available for purchase, but the book is not required. Uh, you might check in your pu local public library's resources to borrow another book that covers Python or search for a free Python text such as this one. Um, additional resources would be other, other courses. It's a little hard to see where the library is here. And indeed, with the pedagogical goals for, for this course, um, for, for computer programming, perhaps the library would not necessarily underpin the goals for this course uh, uh, so well. But we did a little bit of that. Um, and then I uh, did uh, what one does and picked up the phone and contacted um, the partners from the, inst um, from the OCLC Research Partnership who were represented at the time, this was um, back in December and January, who were represented in these different um, cohorts. So uh, with Coursera, I contacted 20 institutions of 32. There are now 70 institutions in um, Coursera, so that's from December to now, uh, big change. In edX, I contacted um, two of the six institutions. There are now 27 institutions in edX, big change. And FutureLearn, which uh, I'll talk about in a little bit, um, had just launched in uh, right in December, right when I was in the middle of doing this work, and I contacted um, four of the 12 institutions, now 24. Um, uh, to kind of get information from them. I also had some really interesting uh, conversations with public libraries and um, in collaboration with my colleague, Christy Hill, who works um, more closely with, with public libraries. And those were really eye-opening and illuminating. Public libraries are really thinking of themselves more as consumers of MOOCs rather than producers of MOOCs um, in an effort to, uh, to kind of um, serve their very broad uh, educational needs of their broad public. Um, and then I enrolled in three MOOCs. I will stop at nothing to bring you information. Uh, it was kind of crazy to take three um, more or less simultaneously, but it, it was also really useful, and I do recommend that to you, even if you um, can't finish them. Nobody really finishes MOOCs, so just go ahead and enroll and poke around and, and see if you can see the library in them for yourself. Um, an, another interesting point about the um, rate of growth in the, um, in the, in the various um, uh, uh, online providers is that uh, it really started out being kind of a, a U.S. and Canadian picture, but it re the, the additions have been um, very much in, in Asia and in, in Europe. So, um, and just out of curiosity, how many of you are at institutions that are in partnership with one of the MOOC providers? I see one tentative hand. Okay. Two, well, two, two hands. Okay, the, so out of a, a big group of people, that's that's not very many. So perhaps coming soon to a campus near you. Um, uh, who knows? Um, so I wanted to um, to talk a little bit about. So that's kind of the U.S. situation is really characterized by these um, startup institutions, but uh, the U.K. Uh, launched in December, as I mentioned, Future Learn, which is um, under the umbrella of the Open University. In um, maybe in January or February or March, um, Open to Study launched. This is uh, under the auspices of the Australian Open University. And um, just very recently, Open Up Ed launched, which is a European venture that is connected to Open Universities across Europe. So 
I, I think we're starting to see some kind of different national um, MOOC platforms evolve and, and tied to um, open university uh, efforts um, in, in Europe and elsewhere. And I think that these may have a very different flavor than the, um, uh, than the startup uh, MOOCs do in the US. So with the background information um, from, from my interviews, we had an event in March at University of Pennsylvania attended by 150 people. Um, MOOCs and libraries, massive opportunity or overwhelming change and call it covered the following themes, copyright, production and pedagogy, new roles for librarians and audience. And there's um, a summary of all of these pretty in depth. I probably wrote more than I should, but I didn't want to leave out details um, for those who couldn't attend. And there's also videos online for those of you who just can't get enough. Um, so copyright, it turns out that this is how libraries are really right now engaging with, with MOOCs. If you make something available online, you don't have quite the liberty to, um, to put up things that, that aren't open access. Um, so, so there was really a great um, uh, set of talks on copyright. Unfortunately, they're um, really tied into US copyright law because there's a very heavy reliance on fair use within the US courses. Um, but edX, for example, uh, really emphasizes the use of open materials. Um, and there is some concern within the library environment that, um, that reliance on um, open materials really undermines the role of the library in stewarding this larger set of resources that are in copyright and license. Yes, they're not open, but they are important for scholarship. So, so what happens when we have a, a, a big shift in emphasis to only open? It's a, it's a good question. Production and pedagogy. It was interesting to talk to um, libraries who had little or no engagement. There was MOOC stuff going on on campus, but they were kind of sitting around waiting for the phone to ring. And then there were other libraries that were very, very, very engaged. They were at the table and part of the production team and um, were really part of uh, the, the conversation, and that was very encouraging. And along with that, there are a number of people who are looking for roles for for um, librarians and libraries within MOOCs, so embedding research skills modules where appropriate and where the, um, the pedagogical needs of the course call for it. And of course, um, we also had a look at audience who's taking these classes. And um, there's some really interesting stuff there, but there's been a lot written about it, so I'm not gonna go into detail on that. And you can also check out the blog. Um, so one of the things we did is we had uh, discussion sessions and had people kind of prioritize where they thought the next steps were for libraries. And kind of at the top of the list was get the library involved. If um, you are partnering with, with a MOOC provider, you know, make sure that the library is, is in those discussions. Um, the other thing that we can do is really start talking about our experiences and working with MOOCs and sharing information. And I think the event we had in March was a really great step to, to that. Um, there had not been a lot of sharing up until that point. Um, take MOOCs, I mentioned this before. I think it's really important if you're interested in MOOCs to not really make judgments until you've um, been in the environment. And on the other side, the librarians who've said that they have been um, in the, on the uh, production side of things have had a very different um, experience and role and have had a different understanding of how it works if you see the, the platform from under the, the hood. Um, another thing is um, licensing and access. So uh, thinking about when you're, um, when you're negotiating a contract or when you're working with faculty, um, make sure that your, your licenses will accommodate downstream use of uh, materials in MOOCs um, when appropriate. And you know, be, be pushy about this. Um, create MOOCs. This is one I'm a little more skeptical about. You know, if you have an information literacy class, who's going to take it? But you know, um, it could be a really great experience to uh, to to do uh, to create a MOOC. And um, naturally, you want to be in there, get involved. If you have faculty who are teaching in MOOCs, find out how the library can be supportive and be by their side. I think that this uh, goes along with much of what we said during this conference, being being sure that as um, teaching and research are evolving on, on class on campus that we have a sense of, of how it's evolving and how the library can be can be um, involved and really going along with that reassess our assumptions and practices around teaching um, if, if teaching on campus is really shifting in a big way shouldn't we understand where that's going or at least be engaged in conversations about how it might change 
Um, another outcome is that uh, along with the um, Open University, I'm happy to say that we are uh, planning a MOOCs and Libraries Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, so maybe I'll use some of those slides that were shown yesterday. Those were really terrific. Um, uh, on um, Friday, July 12th in Central London, y'all are invited if you want to come. There's some uh, preliminary information uh, available, and I'm tweeting out those URLs possibly as we speak. Um, and I wanted to wrap up by, uh, by drawing an, an analogy. Um, uh, one of the things that has been debated within libraries, at least within the U.S. context, is whether or not libraries, particularly academic libraries, are appropriate places for maker spaces. Um, should you have a 3D printer on hand um, if your students or faculty need one? Um, and whether or not you think a maker space is a good, I good idea or not, it, it is an area for experimentation and for the library to head out perhaps in a new direction. Um, and I think that, uh, that MOOCs are, are kind of like that. It's a really great time to get in and experiment. Um, it's a good time for uh, successes. It's also a great time for failures. Um, and it's a really great time to share information with uh, one another. I think it's really too soon to say um, if this is going any place or if we'll wind up with, I think it's very unlikely that we'll wind up with MOOCs as they are. I think that we're at the beginning of a process of the evolution of online learning on our campuses. Um, we're definitely not at the end. So approach this in the, in the spirit of, of experimentation. Um, become a maker yourself. Um, and with that, I'd like to close and see if you have any questions for me. Thank you. Okay, so time for a question or two. Yes? No? Okay, then as we're tight on schedule, um, 